and welcome to Coached by Tara, the podcast where Tara... Hi, that's me. ...coaches me, hi, I'm Mike, on all books and stuff. <laughs> reading, reading stuff. One yeah. day I'll have a good intro, but today is not that day. Right now we are tackling New Moon as part of the Twilight series by Stephanie Meyer. Yes. We are on chapter six? Yes. Yes, we just completed chapter five, Cheater. 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 And so uh, I'm going to give a quick recap of that one for okay. us, as, as we do here on Coach by Terra. Yes, let's recap. So the recap is uh, Bella is no longer numb because of the, she felt, she basically pushed herself into adrenaline in the previous chapter, and now she heard Edward's voice in her head telling her not to do stuff. And so now she doesn't feel as numb, but she's starting to have the after effects of, fe- of feeling everything. And so she stops, she, she starts thinking about how Edward said he would just eliminate himself from existence. And so she pulled over her car and was pretty, like, just sitting there, like, staring out into the void. Then she realized she wanted to Not break, keep her promise. Not keep her promise, to cheat on that promise, so to speak. Because he did. Because, because he did. Because she's, like, basically, like, there's never any way that, like, his promise of simply never existing would exist. Exactly, exactly, because he took away all the material possessions and stuff, but that doesn't that doesn't stop anything. So she finds some motorcycles that are out of out of uh, out of whack that they these people she knows let her have, and then she decides let's bring them to Jacob because he can help me fix them. And uh, she kind of her and Jacob definitely are clicking. <laughs> They're clicking. They're clicking, and and he's agreeing Two to help her. Two pieces of the puzzle connecting, I said. Yeah, and he's uh he's attempting to help her fix these motorcycles, and he's excited because he gets to spend time with her because he definitely is sweet on Bella. Mm-hmm. And she mm-hmm. even interacted with Billiam, who didn't Billiam. rub it in her face that Edward is an idiot. So that's good. Yeah. And then the chapter ends with them. Uh, Agreeing to work on these motorcycles together and have her pay for the parts and use her college fund to do it and all this stuff. Uh, Jacob's a 16 year old boy, but he's six foot five. Yes. And it's Stephanie large. Meyer had a, a really strange description of a 16 year old <laughs> boy in the book. But anyway. So basically, she's 16 and she's 18. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's not weird for it's not weird for Bella. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a little. It's weird. a little weird. <laughs> it's a little weird. It's like when the senior dates the freshman. Mm, I was. I or was 16 when I was okay, a junior. Whatever. I was a 16-year-old junior. Well, you were an old junior, or a young junior. Anyway, so that was the chapter. Uh, Now we're moving on to chapter six, which is called... Friends. Aw, they're going to be friends. That's my prediction. (laughs) Okay, that's Good prediction, right? Yep, okay, great. They're going to be friends, Bella and... Do you think they're going to do anything? What do you you mean by that? I meant, like, do you think they're going to start on the bikes? Yeah, oh, no. Uh... Yes, yes, they are going to <laughs> like, work on the bikes. Okay, whatever. <laughs> anyway, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we are going to cover this chapter. That sounds So we'll great. be right back.
Tara. Yes. I'm ready for you to coach me. I'm ready for my coaching. Let's Please do it. Please coach me. <laughs> Please. Please, I'm begging you to okay. coach me. Okay. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> um, so then it starts off with um, her noting that, like, because it, it goes right from that. Like, it's not a, jo- a time jump like sometimes it's these just chapters like, are. It's like, yo, they were, working, they were talking about working on the bikes. They got the bikes in the garage. Yep. Now they're looking at them. And it says, like, that they don't need to be hidden any further than, like, putting them in Jacob's shed because Billy's wheelchair can't, like, maneuver out there on the uneven ground. So they, like, don't even have to really hide them that much. Wow. Um, That's... Okay. Yeah, I know. I don't know why it mentions that. He starts by pulling out the first bike, which is a red one. It's destined for her. And he starts, like, pulling it apart immediately. Like, he just, like, to see what's going on. And he opens up the passenger door of the rabbit so he can sit that on that, like, as a seat instead of the ground. Um, and then while he's working, he's just, like, talking to her and... um. She notes that it's very it's super nice because he only needs like the slightest of acknowledgement in his conversation, like to keep it going. He likes to talk. Yes. And he basically updates her on, you know, the progress of his sophomore year, um, about how his classes are and his two best friends. And his two best friends are named Quill and Embry. And she's like, Well, those are unusual names and He's like, well, Quill's a hand-me-down name, and Embry got named after a soap opera star. I can't say anything, though. They fight dirty if you start on their names. They'll tag-team you. Good friends, I raised one eye's brow. No, they are. Just don't mess with their names. Just then, a call echoed in the distance. Jacob, someone shouted. Is that Billy, I asked? No, Jacob ducked his head, and it looked like he was blushing under his brown skin. Speak of the devil, he mumbled, and the devil shall appear. (laughs) Jake, are you out here? The shouting voice was closer now. Yeah, Jacob shouted back inside. We waited through the short silence until two tall, dark-skinned boys strolled around the corner into the shed. One was slender and almost as tall as Jacob. His black hair was chin-length and parted down the middle. One side tucked behind his left ear while the right side swung free. The shorter boy was more burly. His white t-shirt strained over his well-developed chest and he seemed gleefully conscious of that fact. His hair was so short, it was almost a buzz. His well-developed chest? He was just like, he has pecs, you know? Yeah, he's got got tits. (laughs) Both boys stopped short when they saw me. The thin boy glanced swiftly back and forth between Jacob and me, while the brawny boy kept his eyes on me, a slow smile spreading across his face. Hey, guys, Jacob greeted them half-heartedly. Hey, Jake. The short one said without looking away from me. I had to smile in response. His grin was so impish. When I did, he winked at me. Hi there. Quill, Embry, this is my friend Bella. Quill and Embry, I still didn't know which was which, exchanged a loaded look. Charlie's kid, right? The brawny boy asked me, holding out his hand. That's right, I confirmed, shaking him with hands with him. His grasp was firm. It looked like he was flexing his bicep. I'm Quillateria. I don't know how to say his last name for real. Ateria? Atira? I'm Quillateria, he announced grandly before releasing my hand. Um, So that's the brawny one. Nice to meet you, Quill. Hi, Bella. I'm Embry. Embry Call. You probably already figured that out, though. Embry smiled a shy smile and waved with one hand, which he then shoved into the pocket of his jeans. I nodded. Nice to meet you, too. So what are you guys doing, Quill asked, still looking at me. Bella and I are going to fix up these bikes, Jacob explained inaccurately, but bikes seem to be the magic word. Both boys went in to examine Jacob's project, drilling him with educated questions. Many of the words they used were unfamiliar to me, and I figured I'd have to have a Y chromosome to really understand the excitement of it all. They were still immersed in talks of parts and pieces when I decided that I needed to head back home before Charlie showed up here. With a sigh, I slid out of the rabbit. Jacob looked up apologetic. We're boring you, aren't we? Nah, and it wasn't a lie. I was enjoying myself. How strange. I just have to go cook dinner for Charlie. Oh, well, I'll finish taking these apart tonight and figure out what more we'll need to get started rebuilding them. When do you want to work on them again? Could I come back tomorrow? Sundays were always the bane of my existence. There was never enough homework to keep me busy. 
Quill nudged Embry's arm, and they exchanged grins. Jacob smiled in delight. That would be great. If you make a list, we can go shop for parts, I suggested. Jacob's face fell a little. I'm still not sure I should let you pay for any everything. I shook my head. No way. I'm bankrolling this party. You just have to supply the labor and the expertise. Embry rolled his eyes at Quill. That doesn't seem right, Jacob shook his head. Jake, if I took these to a mechanic, how much would he charge me, I pointed out. He smiled. Okay, you are getting a deal. Not to mention the riding lessons, I added. Quill grinned widely at Embry and whispered something I didn't catch. Jacob's hand flashed out to smack the back of Quill's head. That's it. Get out, he muttered. (laughs) So he made a comment about riding lessons. Mm. I just realized that right now. (laughs) No, riding lessons. No, really. I have to go, I protested, heading for the door. I'll see you tomorrow, Jacob. As soon as I was out of sight, I heard Quill and Embry chorus, Woo! (laughs) The sound of a brief scuffle fouled, interspersed with an ouch and a hey. If either of you set so much as one toe on my land tomorrow, I heard Jacob threaten. His voice was lost as I walked through the trees. I giggled quietly. The sound made my eyes widen in wonder. I was laughing, actually laughing, and there wasn't even anyone watching. I felt so weightless that I laughed again just to make the feeling last longer. So she's in, like, a pretty good mood. Yeah. Yeah, so then she gets home... And she was just taking like fried chicken out of a pan when she, he when Charlie gets home, and he's she like smiles when he walks in, and he's shocked. He's like, he, what the fuck? He's like, "Hey, did you have fun with Jacob?" And she's like, "Yeah, actually, I did." And he's like, "Well, what did you do?" And he's she's like, "Well, I just hung out in his garage and watched him work. Like, do you know he's rebuilding a Volkswagen?" And uh, Charlie mentions that Billy has told him that before, and she, the interrogation of him like asking all the questions has to stop when he has to chew his food, obviously. But he studied Bella's face like throughout their whole dinner because obviously it's changed since the last time he saw her because she's like happier and it's like weird she's for him. She's being a human being yeah. instead of a zombie. <laughs> After dinner, like, you know, she, she still, like, is in that phase of, like, trying to occupy all of her time, though. So she cleans the kitchen twice, and she does homework while um, Charlie watches the hockey game. And then they she finally, like, goes upstairs. It says, as I climbed the stairs, I felt the last of the afternoon's abnormal sense of well-being drained from my system, replaced by a dull fear that the thought of what was I, what I was going to have to live through now. I wasn't numb anymore. Tonight would, no doubt, be as horrific as last night. I lay down on my bed and curled into a ball in preparation for the onslaught. I squeezed my eyes shut, and the next thing I knew, it was morning. I stared at the pale silver light coming through my window, stunned. For the first time in more than four months, I'd slept without dreaming, dreaming or screaming. I couldn't tell which emotion was stronger, the relief or the shock. I lay still in my bed for a few minutes, minutes waiting for it to come back, because something must be coming, if not the pain, then the numbness. I waited, but nothing happened. I felt more rested than I had in a very long time. I didn't trust this to last. It was a slippery, precarious edge that I balanced on, and it wouldn't take too much to knock me down. Just glancing around my room with these suddenly clear eyes, noticing how strange it looked, too tidy like I didn't live here at all, was dangerous. I pushed that thought from my mind and I concentrated as I got dressed on the simple fact that I was going to see Jacob again today. The thought made me feel almost hopeful. Maybe it would be the same as yesterday. Maybe I wouldn't have to remind myself to look interested and to nod or smile at appropriate intervals, the way I had to with everyone else. Maybe, but I wouldn't trust this to last either. Wouldn't trust it to be the same so easy as yesterday. I wasn't going to set myself up for disappointment like that. So she's just preparing herself like emotionally all the time. I feel like she doesn't trust that. She doesn't have trust in like any of it anymore, which is kind of sad. And then they go. She goes down to breakfast, and Charlie is like careful too because he's like, "What the heck?" Because last night she was like so in such a better mood, and he's like, "What are you doing today?" And he's like, she's like, well, I'm going to go hang out with Jacob again. He nodded without looking up. Oh, he said, 
Do you mind? I pretended to worry. I could stay. He glanced up quickly, a hint of panic in his eyes. No, no, you go ahead. Harry was going to come up to watch the game with me anyways. Maybe Harry could give Billy a ride up, I suggested. The fewer the witnesses, the better. That's a great idea. I wasn't sure if the game was just an excuse for kicking me out, but he looked excited now. He headed to the phone while I donned my rain jacket. I felt self-conscious with the checkbook shoved in my jacket pocket. It was something I never used. So then, it's raining really hard that day. She describes it as rain coming down like water slapped from a bucket. <laughs> and she had to drive more slowly than she wants to, but she finally gets to Jacob's house. Yay, after all this time. Yay. Only an, after, only a, an evening that she was away. He, Jacob runs out before she's even parked, and he's like, Charlie called and said, you're on your way. And it says, effortlessly, without a conscious command to the muscles around my lips, my answering smile spread across my face. A strange feeling of warmth bubbled up in my throat, despite the icy rain splattering on my cheeks. Hi, Jacob. Good call on inviting Billy up. He held up his hand for a high five. I had to reach so high to slap his hand that he laughed at me. Harry showed up to get Billy just a few minutes later. Jacob took me on a brief tour of his tiny room while we waited to be unsupervised. So where to, Mr. Goodwrench, I asked as soon as the door closed behind Billy. Jacob folded out, pulled out a folded paper of his po- out of his pocket and smoothed it out. We'll start at the dump first to see if we can get lucky. This could get a little expensive, he warned me. These bikes are going to need a lot of help before they'll run again. My face didn't look worried, though, so he continued. I'm talking about maybe more than a couple hundred dollars here. I pulled out my checkbook out, fanned myself with it, and rolled my eyes at his worries. We're covered. So she's, like, strangely lighthearted, you know? Yeah, and she's also, like, she has access to her college fund, apparently. Yeah, Because it's, it's just money. all her money that yeah, she's earned from through Newton's, working. I think. Oh, okay. From Fig Newton's house? Fig, from like, the Fig Newton store, store where people eat Fig Newtons or something. Worst store of all time. <laughs> Like a banana store. Like bananas are fine and everything, but why would you need a store just for bananas? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but exactly. Why would you need a Fig Newton store? I don't know. Uh, she describes it as a very strange kind of day um, th- and that she enjoyed herself. And she wonders if it's just the aftershock of losing the numbness or if it's just like that it doesn't even need an explanation that she's just feeling normal. It says, I was beginning to think it was mostly Jacob. It wasn't just that he was always so happy to see me or that he didn't watch me out of the corner of his eye waiting for me to do something that would mark me as crazy or depressed. It was nothing that related to me at all. It was Jacob himself. Jacob was simply a perpetually happy person and he carried that happiness with him like an aura, sharing it with whoever was near him. Like an earthbound sun, whenever someone was within his gravitational pull, Jacob warmed them. It was natural, a part of who he was. No wonder I was so eager to see him. Um, And then they decide to take Bella's truck, and he, like, looks at the, like, hole in her dashboard from the stereo. He's like, what the fuck? Yeah, and he's like, what the heck? And he's like, did it break? And she, like, lies and says, yeah. And he's like. Yeah, what's she going to say, that I clawed it out? Yeah, and he's like, well, who took it out? There's, like, a lot of damage. And he's, she's like, well, I did that. And he's like, maybe you shouldn't touch the motorcycles too much then. (laughs) And then they went to the dump and he's like excited about some of the things that he found there. Um, And then down from there, they went to like this other auto parts place um, in in another city. Um, And it was a two hour drive south. Yikes. Um, But they the time passed super easily and he talked about his friends and school and she found herself asking him questions and not even pretending, truly curious to hear what he had to say. And then he complains. He's like, I'm doing all the talking. He complained after a long story about Quill and the trouble he'd stirred up by asking out a senior's girlfriend. Why don't you take a turn? What's going on in Forks? It has to be more exciting than La Push. Wrong, I sighed. There's really nothing. Your friends are a lot more interesting than mine. I like your friend. Quill's funny, he frowned. I think Quill likes you, too. I laughed. He's a little young for me. Jacob's frown deepened. He's not that much younger than you. It's just a year and a few months. I had a feeling we weren't talking about Quill anymore. I kept my voice light, teasing. Sure, but considering the difference in maturity between guys and girls, don't you have to count that in dog years? What does that make me, about 12 years older? 
He laughed, rolling his eyes. Okay, but if you're going to get picky like that, you have to average in size, too. You're so small, I'll have to knock off ten years off your total. Five foot four is perfectly average, I sniffed. It's not my fault you're a freak. We bantered like that till Hoquiam, which is the city they're going to. Still arguing over the correct formula to determine age. I lost two more years because I didn't know how to change a tire, but gained one back for being in charge of the bookkeeping at my house. Until we were in Checker and Jacob had to concentrate again. We found everything left on his list, and Jacob felt confident that he could make a lot of progress with our haul. By the time we got back to LaPush, I was 23 and he was 30. He was definitely weighing skills in his favor. I hadn't forgotten the reason for what I was doing, and even though I was enjoying myself more than I'd thought possible, there was no lessening of my original desire. I still wanted to cheat. It was senseless, and I really didn't care. I was going to be as reckless as I could possibly manage in Forks. I would not be the only keeper. I would not be the only keeper of any empty contract. Getting to spend time with Jacob was just as much a bigger perk than I'd expected. Billy wasn't back yet, so we didn't have to be sneaky about unloading our day's spoils. As soon as we had everything laid out on the plastic floor next to Jacob's floor next to Jacob's toolbox, he went right to work, still talking and laughing while his fingers combed expertly through the metal pieces in front of him. Jacob's skills with his hands were fascinating. They looked too big for the delicate tasks they performed with ease and precision. While he worked, he seemed almost grateful, graceful. Unlike when he was on his feet there, his height and weight, his height and big feet made him nearly as dangerous as I was. So he was like bumbly when he's like standing, but he's graceful working with his hands. Yeah, he's got skills. He's got skills. Computer hacking skills. Both staff skills. <laughs> I just watched Napoleon Dynamite the other day. So good. Quill and Embry did not show up, so maybe his threat yesterday had been taken seriously. The day passed too quickly. It got dark outside the mouth of the garage before I was expecting it, and then we heard Billy calling for us. I jumped up to help Jacob put things away, hesitating because I wasn't sure what I should touch. Just leave it, he said. I'll work on it later tonight. Don't forget about your schoolwork or anything, I said, feeling a little guilty. I didn't want him to get in trouble. That plan was just for me. Bella. Both our heads snapped up as Charlie's familiar voice wafted through the trees, sounding closer than the house. Shoot, I muttered. Coming, I yelled toward the house. Let's go, Jacob smiled, enjoying the cloak and dagger. He snapped the light off, and for a moment I was blind. Jacob grabbed my hand and towed me out of the garage and through the trees, his feet finding the familiar path easily. His hand was rough and very warm. Despite the path, we were both tripping over our feet in the darkness, so we were, almost, so we were also both laughing when the house came into view. The laughter, laughter did not go deep. It was light and superficial, but still nice. I was sure he wouldn't notice the faint hint of hysteria. I wasn't used to laughing, and it felt right and also very wrong at the same time. So weird. Right and wrong. Right and wrong. The um, laughter. And then they catch a glimpse of, like, Charlie and uh, Billy, and they both say, hey, Dad, at the same time, and they're, like, laughing. Cause, hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. They said it hey, together. Man. And Charlie, like, is staring at her because Jacob's hand is around her still, and they're laughing. And then Charlie's like, well, they invited us for dinner, and they're having spaghetti. Yo, and spaghetti. Billy's like, it's my super secret recipe handed down for generations. And Jacob's like, well, I don't think ragu's actually been around that long. Got him. <laughs> Roasted. <laughs> it wasn't just them at dinner. It was also Harry Clearwater with his family, his wife, Sue, whom I knew vaguely from my childhood summer in Forks, and his two children, Leah, who was a senior like me, but a year older. She was beautiful in an exotic way. Perfect copper skin, glistening black hair, eyelashes like feather dusters, and very preoccupied. She was on Billy's phone when we got in, and she never let it go. Seth was 14. He hung on Jacob's every word with idolizing eyes. There were too many of us for the kitchen table, so Charlie and Harry brought chairs out to the yard, and we ate spaghetti off of plates on our laps in the dim light from Billy's open door. The men talked about the game, and Harry and Charlie made fishing plans. Sue teased her husband about his cholesterol and tried, unsuccessfully, to shame him into eating something green and leafy. 
Jacob talked mostly to me and Seth, who interrupted eagerly, eagerly whenever Jacob seemed in danger of forgetting him. Charlie watched me, trying to be inconspicuous about it, but with pleased but cautious eyes. It was loud and sometimes confusing as everyone talked over everyone else, and the laughter from one joke interrupted the telling of another. I didn't have to speak often, but I smiled a lot, and only because I felt like it. I didn't want to leave. This was Washington, though, and the inevitable rain eventually broke up the party. Billy's living room was much too small to provide an option for continuing the get-together inside. Harry had driven Charlie down, so we rode together in my truck on the way home. He asked about my day, and I told mostly the truth, that I'd gone with Jacob to look at parts and then watched him look in, work in his garage. Um, so then they just are having a conversation, and he's like, do you think you'll visit again anytime soon? And she's like, yeah, I kind of want to come back tomorrow after school. And Charlie's like, what? And she's like, but don't worry, like, I'm going to take my homework. And he's like, just be sure to do that, you know. But he's also trying to disguise his satisfaction. Because right. Charlie's happy that she's distracted. Um, or, like, at least feeling better, you know. Yeah. And she get, got nervous again. She gets nervous again when they, she gets home because the warmth of Jacob's presence was fading. And in, her, in its absence, her anxiety was growing stronger. She wasn't sure that she could get away with, like, having two peaceful nights of sleep in a row. She's like, is it going to happen again? Like, I don't know. Right. She doesn't trust it. Um, and then she checks her email. AOL, probably. Yeah, to put off her bedtime, and she has a message from her mommy, Renee. She writes about her day, like Renee talks about like some book club that she's in now, and that she's um, substitute teaching, and that Phil is uh, has a new coaching job, and that they're planning a second honeymoon trip to Disney World. <laughs> So Yo. Renee's talking about a lot of different stuff. And then... A couple Disney adults. Yep. <laughs> um, and then she, like, notices that the whole thing reads like a journal entry rather than, like, a letter to her. And she feels remorse. She was like, man, like, I must have not been, like, saying enough, you know? Like, or having enough to talk about where she's just, like, telling about everything. Like, every little thing. And... She writes back, like, commenting on each part of her letter and, like, giving her own information for once, probably, um, about, like, how they had spaghetti dinner and, like, how she watched Jacob build parts of a car. She's, like, remembering while she's writing that she can barely remember what she'd even written to her in response, like, even last week. So she feels even guiltier, like, that she's probably, like, really worried and that's right. why she's, like, telling her everything, you know? And then she stayed up extra late to, like, work on homework, and she's just, like, so nervous to fall asleep, and it was within reason because she awoke screaming again. No! Yeah. As the dim morning light filtered through the fog outside my window, I laid in my bed and still tried to shake off the dream. There had been a small difference last night, and I concentrated on that. Last night, I had not been alone in the woods. Sam Uly, the man who had pulled me from the forest floor that night I couldn't bear to think of consciously, was there. It was an odd, unexpected alteration. The man's dark eyes had been surprisingly unfriendly, filled with some secret he didn't seem inclined to share. I had stared at him as often as my frantic searching had allowed. It made me uncomfortable under all the usual panic to have him there. Maybe that was because when I didn't look directly at him, his shape seemed to shiver and change in my peripheral vision. Yet he did nothing but stand and watch. Unlike the time when we had met in reality, he did not offer his help. So that's how her dream changed. Is that S Sam was just there. Yes. Being all creepy and weird. Yes. Charlie stared at me during breakfast and I tried to ignore him. I suppose I deserved it and I couldn't expect him not to worry. It would probably be weeks before he stopped watching for the return of the zombie, and I would just have to try to not let it bother me. After all, I would be watching for the return of the zombie, too. Two days was hardly long enough to call me cured. School was the opposite. Now, now that I was paying attention, it was clear that no one was watching here. 
I'd remember the first day I'd come to Forks High School, how desperately I'd wished that I could turn gray, fade into the wet concrete of the sidewalk like an oversized chameleon. It seemed I was getting that wish answered just a year late. It was like I wasn't there. Even my teacher's eyes slid past my seat as if it were empty. I listened all through the morning, hearing once again the voices of the people around me. I tried to catch up on what was going on, but the conversations were so disjointed that I gave up. Jessica didn't look up when I sat down next to her in calculus. Hey, Jess, I tried to put on with nonchalance. How was the rest of your weekend? She looked at me with suspicious eyes. Could she still be angry, or was she just too impatient to deal with a crazy person? Super, she said, turning back to her book. That's good, I mumbled. The figure of speech cold sh shoulder seemed to have some literal truth to it. I could feel the warm air blowing through from the floor vents, but I was still too cold. I put the jacket off the back of my chair and put it on again. My fourth hour of class got out late, and the lunch table I always sat at was full by the time I arrived. Mike was there, Jessica and Angela, Connor, Tyler, Eric, and Lauren. Katie Marshall, the redheaded junior who lived around the corner from me, was sitting with Eric and Austin Marks, older brother to the boy with the motorcycles, was next to her. I wondered how long they'd been sitting there, unable to remember if this was the first day or something that was a regular habit. I was beginning to get annoyed with myself. I might as well have been packed in styrofoam peanuts through the last semester. No one looked up when I sat down next to Mike, even though the chair squealed stridently against the linoleum as I dragged it back. I tried to catch up with the conversation. Mike and Connor were talking sports, so I gave up on that one at once. Where is Ben today? Lauren was asking Angela. <clears throat> I perked up interested. I wonder if that meant that Angela and Ben were still together. I barely recognized Lauren. She cut off all of her blonde corn silk hair. Now she had a pixie cut so short that the back was shaved like a boy. What an odd thing for her to do. I wished I knew the reason behind it. Did she get gum stuck in it? Did she sell it? Had all the people she was habitu habitually nasty to caught her behind the gym and scalped her? I decided it wasn't fair for me to judge her now by my former opinion. For all I knew, she turned into a nice person. Remember, it's like the person that she didn't like yeah, the yeah. most. Ben's got the stomach flu, Angela said in a calm, quiet voice. Hopefully it's just a 24-hour thing. He was really sick that last night. Angela had changed her hair, too. She'd grown out her layers. What did you two do this weekend, Jessica asked, not sounding as if she cared about the answer. I'd bet that this was just the opener so that she could tell her own stories. I wonder if she would talk about poor Angelus with me sitting two seats away. Was I that invisible that no one would feel uncomfortable discussing me while I was still there? We were going to have a picnic Saturday, actually, but changed our, but we changed our minds, Angela said. There was an edge to her voice that caught my interest. Just not so much. That's too bad, she said, about to launch into her story. But I wasn't the only one paying attention. What happened? Lauren asked curiously. Well, Angela se said, seeming more hesitant than usual, although she was always reserved. We drove up north, almost to the hot springs. There's a good spot just about a, a mile up the trail. But when we were halfway there, we saw something. Saw something? What? Lauren's pale eyebrows pulled together. Even Jess seemed to be listening now. I don't know, Angela said. We think it was a bear? It was black anyway, but it seemed too big. Lauren snorted, oh, or not you too. Her eyes turned mocking, and I decided I didn't need to give her the benefit of the doubt. Obviously, her personality had not changed as much as her hair. Tyler tried to sell me that one last week. You're not going to see any bears that close to the resort, Jessica said, siding with Lauren. Really, Angela protested in a low voice, looking down at the table. We did see it. Lauren snickered. Mike was still talking to Connor, not paying attention to the girls. No, she's right, I threw in impatiently. We had a hiker in just Saturday who saw the bear, too, Angela. He said it was huge and black and just outside of town, didn't he, Mike? There was a moment of silence. Every pair of eyes at the table turned to stare at me in shock. The new girl, Katie, had her mouth hanging open, like she just witnessed an explosion. Nobody moved. So, because she actually said she was something, like, what people the? were Everyone's like, what the? the fuck? 
Mike, I muttered, mortified. Remember the guy with the bear story? Story. Story? Story? Can't speak anymore. Sure, Mike started after a second. I didn't know why he was looking at me so strangely. I talked to him at work, didn't I? Did I? I thought so. Mike recovered. Yeah, there was a guy who said he saw a huge black bear right at the trailhead, bigger than a grizzly. He confirmed. Hmm. Lauren turned to Jessica, her shoulders stiff, and changed the subject. Did you hear back from USC, she asked. Everyone else basically, like, looked away because they were like, right. what the freak? And then Angela smiled back at her, but she was like, what? That's so, like, this is, okay, whatever. And then, um, what, so then Mike finally is like, okay, so then what did you do this weekend, Bella? Like, because now she's talking. And she is honest. She says, Friday night, Jessica and I went to a movie in Port Angeles. And then I spent Saturday afternoon and most of Sunday down at La Push. The eyes flickered to Jessica and back to me. Jess looked irritated. I wondered if she didn't want anyone to know she'd gone out with me or whether she just wanted to be the one to sell- tell the story. What movie did you see? Mike asked, starting to smile. Dead end. The one with the zombies. I grinned in encouragement. Maybe some of the damage I'd done in these past zombie months were rep- was reparable after all. I heard that was scary. Did you think so? Mike was eager to continue the conversation. Bella had to leave at the end. She was so freaked. Jessica inserted with a sly smile. So Jessica got her two cents in. Right. (laughs) It was pretty scary. So then Mike doesn't like stop asking questions until lunch over. And like Angela talks to her too. And Angela actually comes up to her after lunch and is like, thanks for speaking up, like sticking up for me. Like, Because no one was going to believe her. Right. And then she asks Bella, like, are you okay? And Bella notes, like, that's why she'd picked Jessica over Angela for the girls' night anyways. Because Angela was too perceptive. Like, Angela knows that Bella's not really okay. Right. Um, Because she's too nice. Like, the thing is, is, like, Angela's actually a good friend. And Jessica's kind of like a surface-level shallow friend, you know? And Bella actually says, not completely, I admitted, but I'm a little bit better. I'm glad, she said. I've missed you. Lauren and Jessica strolled by us then, and I heard Lauren whisper loudly, oh joy, Bella's back. What a bitch. Yeah. What a Dumb bi- bitch. Yeah, what a bitch. Your stupid haircut. <laughs> Angela rolled her eyes at them, and I smiled at, and smiled at me in encouragement. I sighed. It was like I was starting all over again. What's today's date? I wondered suddenly. It's January 19th. Hmm. What is it? Angela asked. It was a year ago yesterday that I had my first day here, I mused. Nothing's changed much, Angela muttered, looking after Lauren and Jessica. I know, I agreed. I was just thinking the same thing. And that's the end of the chapter. Oh, wow. Okay. Friends. It's not just about Jacob and her being friends. It's about her it's having about friends. All of her friends. All of her friends. So I um I thought this is what chapter four was gonna be, right? Okay. But now we're finally there. Yes. She's starting to not be as numb to everything and she's starting to come around to being an actual human being as opposed to a zombie gal. Yes. So that's good. So that's... she's starting to like thaw out a little bit, you know? Yeah, she's starting to be a regular member of society. Yes. And all it took was uh going uh you know, going into someone else's arms, so to speak. Kinda. That's I mean that's a thing. Yeah. It kinda it kinda dulls the sting of a breakup if you have someone else to go to, right? I guess so. I mean I've never actually experienced that. Wait, yeah I have. Kind of. Are you talking about me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ter- He's talking about me, everyone. Did, He's I talking dated, about me. I dated a girl for a long time who was a terrible person, and then I- What if she hears this? I hope she does. Oh. <laughs> uh, that means so mean. I'm just saying, she she wasn't very nice to me, and I dealt with it because I didn't, you know. And then I met Tara, and Tara was actually like cared about what I had to say and actually liked spending time with me, and that was weird. And different and great. <laughs> in the best way. Hopefully. In the best way, yes. Weird in the best way. Yes, for sure. Anyway, 
that's going to do it for this week's Coach by Tara. Next week, we'll go to Chapter 7. Thank you so much for listening and watching, guys. Remember, you can always hit us up at uh, cbterrapodcast at gmail.com or on oh, the Discord yes. to chat with us if you want. Yes, 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 yes. And uh, we'll we'll read any emails uh, uh, on air. Actually, I think we have an email. We do? That I ignored. Hold oh, my on. God. I'm so excited. Hold on. I just had, like, a memory. Yeah, so our good friend Tyler Tyler Rims okay. emailed. Uh, I'm excited. And he said. Can I read it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can read it. Oh, <laughs> oh man. This makes me feel bad that I haven't had a few. We've had a few weeks between episodes. Yeah. Welcome back. It says, as the subject line, maybe? Yep. Um, glad season two of CBT is underway. I tried listening to other Twilight podcasts, but they just don't do it like you two. Keep up the coaching, Tara, and continue to be coached, Mike. Also, I, I really need that baby vampire Edward nursing book ASAP. Love, Tyler. <laughs> it says love, question mark, Tyler. I'm just taking out the question mark. No, I, I, it's there. No. Oh. I, I think it's because he loves you and me. He's not sure. About oh, okay. That's good. That makes you feel better. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Tyler, for the email. Sorry that it took us so long to read it because I literally forgot you emailed us because we took so How long. How dare he? I, took, I really should just have access to We that. took so long in between episodes. That, we really um, did. So sorry about that, yo. But yeah, email us like Tyler and we won't be as bad about uh, reading it on the air if you want us to. Anyway, thank you guys for listening and watching. Tara. Thank you for coaching me. You're welcome. And I hope you guys enjoyed your CBT. Bye. Bye.